Well, I have a great uh, blessing today, and that is my daughter Rebecca is with us. She is from, uh, she is from Memphis, and uh, well, actually, I don't know where she's really from, Florida, I guess, but she's from, uh, she's from Memphis this time, and she was supposed to be flying back today, but it's snowing again and icing again in Memphis, and uh, they're afraid, not that the plane won't land, but that she won't be able to get from the airport to home, uh, and so th- she's staying for a couple of extra days with us. And uh, Myra and I are so sad about that. We are, um, in fact, I think that Myra has already said nanny, nanny, boo-boo to Tommy because uh, we get her for a couple of extra days and he doesn't. So um, we are, we're excited. So Rebecca's here today. It's a good thing. And um, I'm excited for that. So let's start. We're going to read starting in verse number one of Ephesians five. And then I'm going to back, I'm going to show you some things that I, that I ended with last time. Uh, and then we're going to press through. Uh, this will be a way to unlock these last two chapters. So starting in verse 1 of Ephesians 5, God's Word says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So y'all look up here just for a second. Let me, let me put this all back into perspective. What we said was that the book of Ephesians is about discovering or knowing our identity in Christ and then living it out in that same identity. So the two parts, verse, uh, chapters 1 to 3, is who we are in Christ, and then chapters 4 through 6 are how do we live as people in Christ. And so here, starting in verse number 1 of chapter 5, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you. So uh, let me start by saying that I believe that many, many, many Christians, including this guy right here, I believe that many Christians fail to walk in their Christ-likeness because we're still stuck on the fact that we're sinners, right? And so we focus on our being sinners when things, when bad things happen, when, when we stumble, when we struggle, uh, our default is, well, I'm a human, I'm a sinner, But I want you to recognize that in Christ, we are free from that power or that entanglement. Um, We, uh, I was just, I I was just talking to Greg about the, uh, about the new door system that we've got. And he said, well, through the week, the default, the default level of our, of our church is going to be locked. And then when we, when we need it unlocked, that'll be the exception. And what he was just, that was something completely different than this. But I want you to know that in Christ, our default setting ought to be sinless, right? Because Jesus died to set us free. Inside of us now, we have this struggle between our old sin nature and this new Christ nature that is now dwelling in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. But our default setting is sinless. It's when we feed the old man, when we run back to the old man, when we embrace the old man, it's then, or old lady, but that sounds so much worse, uh, when, uh, when, when we embrace those things, it's then that we step out of God's plan for us. So while this is still a struggle, while it's absolutely real, a real struggle that we fight every day, every moment of every day, our default setting is sinless. It's, it's living in the spirit. It's free from the power of sin. It's free from the old nature. It's only our struggle that puts us back under. Does that make sense for everybody? I am not saying, I am not saying, by the way, that any one of us can live a sinless life. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that in Christ, that is the default setting. When we are walking fully in Christ, when the Holy Spirit is is leading our lives and we are in obedience, now, uh, it's still not us, it's the Holy Spirit through us, but yet we can live a life that is completely pleasing to God because of the Holy Spirit in us. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, It's one of the reasons, it's so tough, because I absolutely do believe that because of our sin nature in ourselves, we are going to stumble all the time. I, I absolutely believe that. But I also believe in the power of God's plan of salvation. God's plan for our salvation is that we are free from the power of that sin in the Holy Spirit, in Christ, 
And I believe that we do damage to that plan that God has for us when we think that all we can ever do is sin. So I just want to put that because everything else we're going to be talking about flows from that thought. So pick up again in verse 3. But immorality and any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. So what I want you to see is, and and this is the big main part of the handout that I give you, the very first one, is that when we are called into Christ's likeness, when we are invited to walk with him, it's not just a not doing of some of things. It's always put off and put on or not this, but this. Don't live this way, but practice these things. And so we see it all through Paul's writings. We put off the the sinfulness and we put on Christ. We clothe ourselves in Christ. What so many Christians are trying to do is live this life um, uh, in a negative way by not doing bad things, but they are not partaking of the the blessings that, that Christ has given us or the power even, the tools even, that Christ has given us to, um, to actually succeed. Does anybody know what the difference between an amateur and a professional is? Okay, some, some say they get paid. That's in sports, absolutely. What else? Maturity. Maturity, experience. All right, there is one thing that I've noticed between professionals, workmen, handymen, construction workers, whatever, one difference, key difference than them and me. They're tools. They're tools. They've, all, they've got the right tools for everything. I'm trying to do whatever it is that I'm trying to do with a flathead screwdriver and a hammer. And they have things that are designed just to do that, one ver- that very one thing. And then they put it up and they get another tool to do the next thing. They have all the right tools. And you can tell somebody, somebody said experienced earlier, you can tell those even handy, handy men who are becoming experienced and women who are becoming experienced, they are getting, they're gathering those tools. Uh, the, the biggest difference between me and my dad or me and, and Wayne is that they have got every tool for every occasion because they've had to buy them their whole life. And they've kept them. I don't have that stockpile yet. I'm getting there, but I don't have that stockpile yet. And so when they come, they bring all those tools and we can get done what needs to get done. In the Christian life, so many people are trying to live this Christ-like life without the tools that God has given us to live it with. And so what we're doing is we we are exerting a lot of effort. And by the way, that's what happens to an amateur who doesn't have the right tools, it takes a lot more effort to get the job done. I am, uh, so there is a, there is a uh, military unit in the army. Uh, so I don't know how much you know about an army, the army, but they are broken down into regiments. And those regiments aren't there, they're not, they're not how they fight. They fight in battalions and in brigades. Usually in brigade combat teams is how the army fights. But their regiments are some historical continuity into the past. Well, there is a regiment, I think it's the 1st Battalion, 32nd Infantry Regiment, although I may be wrong, that their, uh, that their slogan is brute force and ignorance. That is the way I do most jobs around the house, brute force and ignorance. Uh, we, had a, we had a tree that fell over between my house and the uh, neighbor's house, 
and he wanted to preserve large portions of it so he could send it away to get cut into lumber because it was a hickory, it was good, and he, so he wanted to cut it into eight-foot sections. Well, this tree was this big around, all right? So an eight-foot section of that is heavy. I took a tanker's bar, you know, a pry bar, big, one of those big pry bars like this, and I stuck it under there, and I started moving that thing with just brute force and ignorance to put it onto the, onto the uh, uh, trailer that he had that he wanted it loaded up on. And he's like, oh, no, 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 Jim, no. He's like, we're not going to do that. And I'm like, I'm getting it done. It's going. He goes, no, 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 I got tools. The problem with tools, though, is it takes longer to get them set up than if you just let me have that tanker's bar and keep rolling that thing even though I was exerting lots of force and I'd have been super tired at the end of it, I would have gotten done quicker than him going and setting up all his tools. But once he set up all his tools, it was a come along. All he did, once he set it up, was we just cranked it. Chunk, 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 chunk. And it just rolled, pulled that thing right up onto the trailer pretty as you please. And then we did the next one and did the next one. The same is true with walking the Christian life. Sometimes we think it's faster if we just try to do this thing ourselves without the preparation that it takes in order to uh, adorn ourselves with the tools. Now, we're going to see more of this in Ephesians, but the main tool that I want you to see is the putting on of the Holy Spirit, this, this hiding ourselves in the Spirit or letting the Spirit fill us and equip us. Last week, I ended with the concept of the gloves on a, on a lawnmower. I said, if you take off a garden glove and lay it on the, on the lawnmower, it's not going to do the work. But if you took, put my hands into it and, and attach my hands to my legs, I can get that yard mowed pretty quickly. The same is true with our walk with the Holy Spirit or walk with the Lord. If, if we try to do it, we can't accomplish it. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us, then we can accomplish it. We can do what he's calling us to do. Now, you may say, well, what's he calling us to do? Hold on, I'll get there. Because that's the rest of this, this idea. So last week I talked about wisdom, meaning walking in the Spirit. The way that we walk, walk in wisdom, walk in Christ, walk, be imitators of the Lord, all of this is done through the indwelling power, the filling power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, the way that we practice that is to intentionally yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit's leadership. There's an old picture that I grew up seeing. I don't like it completely because it, it seems to allow something that the Bible doesn't allow. But for the sake of this discussion, uh, the, uh, the picture of the throne of your life or the throne of your heart with the Holy Spirit sitting clearly on it or, the, or Christ sitting clearly on it as the ruler of your life is a great illustration to discuss the filling of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means you allow Him to lead. To not be filled with the Holy Spirit means you're trying to lead. And you can't accomplish godly things when you are leading. The only way that you can accomplish godly things is when the Lord is leading or the Holy Spirit is leading. And so that is, this is the key to the rest of the book of Ephesians uh, go down to verse number 15. Well, that's where we ended. Pick up at verse number 15. Uh, five. I'm in chapter 5. Yes, ma'am. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. When you see that, unwise and wise, know that that means spirit-filled or not spirit-filled. That's really what you're going to see flow out of the rest of this discussion making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish. Now, foolish is the opposite of what? Wisdom, wise, that's right. So not only is unwise not filled with the Spirit, but it, foolish is not filled with the Spirit. And in the Old Testament, I told you last time that foolish is actually equated with lostness. So uh, I believe that you can act foolishly and still be saved, but you're acting like a lost man when you do that. That's, the, that's this picture that we see. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation or wastefulness or, or, or um, throwing, 
throwing stuff out. Dissipation almost is the idea of a vapor that disappears. So it's just, it's just the kind, it, you're just getting rid of um, what God has invested in you. So don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So starting, really starting in chapter 4, but picking up here in verse 5, what he's telling us is how to walk with God, how to walk filled with the Holy Spirit. These chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6 in Ephesians, are the key to living the Christian life. It tells us in chapter 4 what we don't do. We, we don't lie. We don't steal. Um, we don't be ugly to one another. It tells you what you, what, you do, what you do do. It tells you what you are supposed to do. And that is you are to work. You are to share. You are to give. You are to speak truth and grace into people's lives. You're to be kind one, an one to another because these are the ways that Christ has treated us. And so we treat others like Christ has treated us. Now, let me show you this picture. This is a great picture. If we are to be imitators of Christ, and we are, and if the Spirit of God, who is also the Spirit of Christ, is dwelling within us, and if we are yielded to the leadership of the Spirit, then we will mimic Christ absolutely completely in the way that we treat others. So in the way that Christ treated us, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. While we were still lost, he extended his love to us. All of those things that the Bible says about the way he treated us. Forgiving us. Did we deserve to be forgiven? No, but he did. In every way, that's the way that we are supposed to live toward others. Even, so if, if you say this, if you say, um, that Jim Collier is a rascal. Man, he has been ugly to me every day that I've ever known him. I am done with him. I'm not, even if he comes up and asks to for, me to forgive him, I'm not. He's a jerk. That guy's a loser, man. I don't want anything to do with him. That's not treating someone with Christ's likeness because Christ did not do that to us. I mean, I don't know about your walk with the Lord, but it seems like almost daily I have to go back and say, Lord, I messed up again. Will you forgive me? What happens if the, if the Lord just one time said, you know what, Jim, you're on your own now. I'm done with you. You just go on to hell. Well, that, I mean, he, 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 he can't do that because he said he wouldn't, but he could in, in his in his sovereignty, he could have designed things to be that way. You get one chance and one chance only. So if we are going to mimic him, if we're going to live our lives after him, then we have to demonstrate that life to others, whether they deserve it or not. In fact, that's at the end of chapter 4. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So we are to treat others exactly the way that we've been treated by Christ. This is the pattern of the Christian life. The, uh, you know, I grew up in an era, I, I don't hear it much anymore, but I grew up in an era where everybody wanted to know the will of God. That seemed to be like every sermon, every Bible study, every, it was just, how do you know the will of God? How do you live in the will of God? Well, one of the ways that you know and live in the will of God is you do the things that he's told us to do so clearly. You, you can't ignore things like uh, Ephesians 4.32 and then expect him to reveal his will on who you should marry or where you should live or what you should do in your life. You have to do the things that he's revealed to us clearly in order to take those next steps with him. And so what I would just extend to you or, or, or encourage you to do is to live with this idea of being imitators of God. And the way that we imitate God is to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and to live through us in our lives. Uh, it's one thing for people to say, man, I love coming to First Baptist Church because, man, the Spirit of God is there. Now, that's a, that's a great thing, and I'm not knocking it. 
But the Spirit of God cannot be in First Baptist Church unless the Spirit of God is present and filling those Christians who belong to First Baptist Church. Does that make sense? Yeah, he, I hate to say anything that God can't do something, but I'm going to do that right now. God cannot be present in a, in a specially manifested way in a group of people who don't allow him to be that same way in them as individuals. You, you can't, he, he's just not going to do that. He, he fills individuals, and when they come together, he manifests his presence in a special way. So that's my encouragement. Uh, let's, let's keep going. So what he does now, starting in verse um, 21, is he says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So what, I'm, what I want to do is I want to draw this, this logical connection from there to what he's about to do. Starting in verse 15, he's, he talks how to, be, how to walk in wisdom. Be careful how you walk. Walk as wise, not as unwise. Be imitators of God. This idea of being filled with the Spirit is how you do that. And then, starting in verse 21, he ends by saying, well, in, in, in 18, 19, 20, and 21, he shows what that Spirit-filled life looks like. Okay, so the Spirit-filled life means that we're speaking out of the Spirit, we're speaking kindness and gracious words, we're seasoning other people's lives, we're giving thanks for everything. So a thankful heart, a thankful heart is a happy heart. Uh, but a thankful, this, a Spirit-filled heart is a thankful heart. So you can't have, and, and I want you all to hear this, you can't be Spirit-filled and be a complainer. Those don't go together. And, and we Christians quickly run from seeing something that's wrong, which is what we should do, yearning for righteousness, which is what we should do, we go straight to complaining about it. And that's what we shouldn't do. If we're going to, if, if we're going to be a change agent in this world, we don't go to complaining, we continue to give thanks. And then he finishes that in verse 21, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So we submit to one another. Um, this doesn't mean necessarily, although it does imply authority, it's not really about authority, it's about preference. If you submit yourselves to one another, you are allowing others to have the first place. It's not about you getting your way. Submitting to others in the fear of Christ means that they get their way, that they're, that they're that, that you are allowing them to take the lead. And this is the picture. This is the picture of Christ. It's the picture of the disciples. It's the picture of those who follow Christ. It should be the picture of us who are spirit-filled is we, we yield to others on purpose. But then, starting in verse 22 and going into chapter 6, he is going to explore how that practically works itself out in everyday relationships. Let me click this thing. I think I'm there. And so in verses 22 to 33, he says that spirit-filled living affects your marriage relationship. It has to. If, if you are going to walk filled with the Spirit, it has to show up in your marriage. It has to. You can't say, well, now we're going to live, live like the world. So he says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hates, hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So here's, he's speaking to husbands and wives, and he's saying two things. He's saying, wives, you should submit to your husbands as to the Lord. He's saying, husbands, you should love your wives and give your life for them as to the Lord. Now, here's the problem. We have seized on those standards, and they are biblical standards. I mean, obviously, I didn't write this. The Lord spoke through Paul to write this. So this is God's word. But the problem is, we think that this standard is done in the flesh. And so... We like, we don't do it anymore, but in the, in the old days, I, I did, uh, I, I did uh, Mike and Kay Stokes' grandchild, uh, granddaughter's wedding this past weekend. And uh, about, uh, I don't know, three months ago when we were talking about the planning, I asked them, I said, well, what kind of wedding do you, do you see yourself having? And, and uh, they both said, we want a Christian wedding. And I said, okay, no problem. That's the way I do it. Uh, I'm going to share the gospel. Really okay. And then, uh, and then Hannah said, yeah, but I don't want to have to say obey. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, I don't, I don't include that. What do you, why do you say that? And they said, well, we went to a, we went to a Christian wedding of some friends and, uh, the, the preacher went on and on about obeying. Right. And, and she said, that was just kind of weird. And so in, in her wedding, as a hat tip to that thing, just to be funny, because y'all know I like to poke the bear a little bit, uh, and, and I know that uh, her husband, uh, Michael, is going to make captain before she is. He's a little bit ahead of her in the training cycle. And, uh, and I said, so uh, whoever, whoever makes captain first won't, won't have the other one have to say sir or ma'am to them. <laughs> and uh, it, was just a, it was just a little joke. So in the old days... In the old days, we, it, was, it was included that wives must submit to their husbands. And we would say the same thing. We would preach the same kind of standard to men. Men, you must give your, your life for your wife. Now, both of those are true on the, on, on the surface. But what we often do is we divorce chapter, or verse 22 from verses 15 to 21. What this is saying is, is that if we are living spirit-filled lives, these things will occur because this is the way that the spirit works himself out through our lives. We often think that the spirit is just the power to do what we want to do, but that's not it at all. The spirit is the leadership of our lives and he will, if given free reign, manufacture Christ's likeness in our lives. So it's, it's, This is a measure of what it looks like, but it's not a command that you have to perform. It's the natural outworking of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life that's yielded to him. So what I want you to understand is, and and, and we have, it's a, it's a hard thing because it's been abused for, for a pastor to say, wives, you need to obey your husbands, right? Um, That's even for me to say that in this century y'all are probably getting squeamish and you're wanting me to go on. Like you want me to get to uh, chapter six really, really quickly. But what I'm telling you is, is that if you are living spirit filled, he will work it out in your life in such a way that it won't be abusive, right? Because if, if the Holy Spirit is the one doing it, he's not going to abuse you in it. He's going to protect you in it. It's going to be, it's going to be his work, not your work. And so you don't have to worry about those kinds of things because he's the one that's doing it. Men, the same thing. If you love your wives like Christ loved the church, the only way you can do that is through the Spirit of Christ. We think that we're big enough and strong enough and bad enough to do this on our own, but it doesn't work that way. It has to be the Spirit of God dwelling in us to manufacture this kind of response, this kind of relationship in our marriages. So what this is, is less a command and more of a product. That is that if you live yielded to the Holy Spirit, this is the way your marriage relationship is going to look. And Paul doesn't stop there. He says 
that this is really reminiscent of Christ and the church. That, that what the picture is of spirit-filled Spirit-filled husband, spirit-filled wife, living together in respect and love. What this looks like is what it looks like for the church and Christ to live together through respect and love. Now, let me just ask you a question. Are we supposed to submit to Christ? Yes. Is that abusive to us? No. That's the way that Christian marriage is supposed to look And it can only look that way when the two parties are indwelt with the Spirit of God and they walk with his leadership. That's what this passage is commending to us. He does take a kind of take a a right hand turn from here when he talks about this Christological aspect of it that is Christ in the church. And so he's saying that a spirit-filled husband, spirit-filled wife living in this kind of relationship where the, the husband gives complete love to the wife and the wife gives submission to the husband or respect, if you'd rather that word, when those two things work together, it is a picture of the way that we work with Christ. Now, I'll tell you this, Christ has already laid down his life for the church. There is no question on whether he's going to deliver on his end of the bargain. He has done it. He's done it once and for all. It is done. It is complete. The question is, are we as Christians, are we as a church going to live in such a way that we respect Christ, respect what he did, and and follow him, submit to his leadership in our lives? You You cannot be a successful church and not submit to the leadership of Christ, not submit to the the. um the paradigm that he set up in our relationship. Does that make sense? That's what this is. And it goes on. It it doesn't stop here. It starts with the marriage relationship, but then it moves to the the parent-child relationship. So spirit-filled living affects the parent-child relationship. Pick up in verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This too is an expression not of law. We often see that word commandment, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. What they're saying is, all the way back when, when God delivered the, the commandments to Moses, this one came with a promise. And that promise was, if you honor your father and your mother, you will remain in the land for a long time. He's not saying, children, if you obey your parents, God's going to let you live forever. It's not what he's saying. In fact, almost all of us can name a Christian child or even a Christian grown child who has died before their parents did, and yet by all appearances they lived honoring their father and mother. That's not what this is saying. He's saying that this command, that this is not a change from the command that was given back then, but what he is saying is that spirit-filled parents and children live in such a way. That way is the, par- the children obey their parents And that the parents don't frustrate their children. What do you think the biggest way to frustrate a child is? (laughs) Maybe no. I think there's something else. Yes, ma'am. Tell them one thing and you do another. That is the biggest frustration to parents. Now, I remember, so, you know, nowadays, so Rebecca, Rebecca probably thinks that TV has always existed right, the television. She grew up in a, I mean, she doesn't really think that, but in her experience now, you know, we had color TVs. The TVs haven't changed. Now, when she was born, they were big and boxy, and now they're flat, but that's really the only change between then and now. They, they went from big and boxy to, to, to long and flat, but there are some of you in here who remember watching Gilligan's Island on black and white TVs, and you may have had to hold the, hold the rabbit ears, Right? And, and some of you, I don't know, Max isn't here, so I can't pick on him, but some of you may have grown up in a house that didn't even have a TV, black and white or otherwise. And so in, in your experience, 
I don't know where I was going with that. What was I using this as an illustration for? Oh, yeah, how things have changed. And so, and so things have changed by all that. But in this case, it, no, no, I remember what I was saying. It's because the, best, the way to frustrate a child is to say you can do one thing and not do another. So TV was super big in my life. When I grew up, I was like, oh, man, this is awesome. We had a black and white, and we transitioned to color, and I remember that. I also remember that we lived far enough out in rural Hillsborough County that we didn't get cable until I was like 18. So we still had the, all the stuff. that Everybody else had cable, and so we'd go over to their house to watch cool stuff like MTV and other things. But, but when I was growing up, uh, we had that. And there were times when my parents would say to me, all right, you need to go back and play in your bedroom. Your mom and I are going to watch something. <laughs> well, I want to watch something too. And by the way, in those days, we only had the one TV, right? We're going to watch something. Well, I want to watch it. Nope, you can't watch it. Well, why? It's not for you. Well, I want to watch it. Nope, you can't. Well, that was frustrating to me, right? I wanted to watch and so there were times when I would sneak out of my bedroom and I would walk down the hall and, I, and at that time, our couch, so we had, a, we had a, the, the family room, um, we had a, a bar here and then the kitchen, and so, uh, but they had the couch that stuck out f from the wall that kind of cordoned off the, the family room and I would walk in and I would try to hide behind the couch. I thought I was sneaky. Mom and dad always caught me every time. They're like, we told you, you can't watch this. But they were in a hurry. Nowadays, you could push pause and you can say, look, we're not going to do that. In those days, you're like, hurry, we're missing it. Get out of here. Go back to your room. Because <laughs> they couldn't push pause. So that was frustrating to me as a child. The biggest way to frustrate your children, where it says here in verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That means what you tell them to do, you do too. Now, they were just protecting my parents. I'm just using that as an illustration. But if, if your dad or your mom tells you not to lie, and yet you know they lie through their teeth to everybody that's around, that is provoking your child to anger. If you tell them you need to go to church, but you don't go to church, that's going to provoke them to anger. These things, and so spirit-filled children and spirit-filled parents <clears throat> do these things out of the natural outflow of the spirit leading their lives. This is the product of a spirit-filled life. This is not something else that you have to do. This is just what it looks like when the spirit reigns in your life. And not just in parent-child relations, but also spirit-filled living affects master-slave or employer-employee relations. Now, in these days, there were slaves and masters, and it was important. By the way, it's not that slaves and masters was any better then than it was in the 17 or 1800s. That's why he spoke directly to it here. Now, I do believe that the chattel slavery that we had in, that was based on race uh, and color of skin was much different than what they had. But being a slave was still being a slave. And so don't separate the two, thinking that it was really, really easy in Paul's day, and it's really, really hard later on. It was always something that the gospel was going to deal with, that the gospel was going to put aside. But until it did, listen to this. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Well, this again is the outworking of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, you will do these things. They, they will be the natural way. Now, nowadays, we don't have slaves and, and uh, masters, praise the Lord. But what we do have is uh, employees and bosses. We have managers and workers. We have all kinds of things. I believe this applies directly to those relationships as well, that if the Holy Spirit of God is dwelling in your life in power, you will be a good employee. You will be somebody who honors them because you're not honoring them, you're honoring the Lord. Your, your work that you're doing is a picture of what the Lord would do because 
The Holy Spirit of the Lord is living in your life, manufacturing these things as you go. Does this make sense? So all of this is this outworking of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then it goes on, masters or bosses, if you'd prefer, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So you treat them like you want to be treated. Hmm, I need to write that down. That's a good word. Now, that's the golden rule. All of, see, we often read what Paul writes, and we're thinking, man, he's just like building on, but he's just taking what Jesus said, who just took what the law said, and, and fleshed it out and showed what it looks like to live this kind of life. Does that make sense? This is the Christian life. Finally, verse 10 Spirit-filled living is likened to the preparation of a warrior. Just because we are living with the Holy Spirit of God in our lives does not mean we are exempt from spiritual warfare. We are not exempt from being attacked. We are not exempt from the battle that rages all around us. It's, it's not that the Holy Spirit is going to whisk us away to some paradise island out in the middle of the pacific ocean and we just get to live there with no problems for the rest of our existence that's not what happens so long as we're living on this earth spirit filled or not there are going to be problems spiritual problems attacks spiritual attacks so finally verse 10 be strong in the lord and in the strength of his might put on the full armor of god so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Notice, notice what we're called to do. Be strong in the Lord and stand firm. Be strong in the Lord and stand firm. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So what we have is Spirit-filled living is like into the preparation of the warrior. Now it goes through all these different, all these different uh, um, armor pieces, and I've heard pastors break them down, and I've heard people, uh, you know, practice putting them on in their prayer life and those kind of things. And I'm not really knocking that, but what I really want you to understand what he's saying is this: be saved and live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. If you do that you will be clothed with all of this armor. This armor is not an optional, is not optional. Like you can't be saved and be filled with the Spirit and not have the armor of the Lord on. It all goes together. But in the midst of, he really gives us some warnings. One of the warnings is that what we're really called to do is stand firm. We're to stand firm. We don't have to go after anybody. We don't have to go looking for trouble. We just stand firm in the power of his might. And he will protect us. He'll deliver us. He'll take care of us. And so we, we stand firm. The second thing that he says is be clothed in this. So we are clothed when we put on the Spirit, when we, when we practice walking in the fullness of the Spirit. He will clothe us with all of these. I mean, just listen to these things. Truth, righteousness, peace, um, salvation. Well, how can we do any of that apart from the Holy Spirit of God? That's, his, that's right. We can't. That's his gift to us. So we just, we practice being right with him and all these other pieces are going to fall into place. They're all going to be in the right place. 
So, so we, we gear ourselves up in that. And then the, other, the third thing that he shows us is that our enemies aren't who we think they are. They aren't other people. Now, you have to understand this because he's already told us to love our enemies, or he's already told us to be kind to others. He's already told us how we relate to other people. And so now he's saying, look, other people aren't your problem. We're fighting a spiritual battle against spiritual forces. And the only way that you can fight a spiritual battle against spiritual forces is to be filled with the Spirit of God, that, that he is the one that holds you. That's this picture that Paul is showing us. So often what we do in, in the book of Ephesians is we break all this apart as if he's telling us different stuff, right? Here, mind your marriage. Here, take care of your kids. Here, be a good employee. Here, now get clothed in the, in the, um, in the, the, the armor of God. That's what I couldn't call it. The armor of God. But what he's really saying is don't be unwise, but be wise. Don't be drunk with wine, but filled with the Spirit. And this is what being filled with the Spirit looks like in your day-to-day -day life throughout the rest of, uh, rest of these things. And so this is, this is the, the way it goes. And then he says the only offensive weapon that we have besides the Word of God is our prayers. Is our prayers. We pray and the Lord works. Now the Lord works when we don't pray, but somehow he includes because we're spirit-filled, because our minds are being made like his minds, because we are becoming like him in many, many ways, he uses our prayers in the same way that he used the prayers that Jesus prayed to him. Now think about that. Think about that. That the prayers that Jesus prayed were absolutely always answered. And so when we surrender in the same way that Jesus did, to the leadership of the Spirit in our lives, then our desires change to align with God's desires, and then we begin to ask things of Him, and we begin to see Him do things that we might not ever see if we weren't Spirit-filled. So this is this paradigm that He's given us. So um, Spirit-filled living engages in significant prayers. Listen to the prayers that Paul says. With all prayer and petition... Pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf. So he, Paul is saying, pray for me, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Listen to this. Paul is in jail because of the gospel. So what he's asking them to do is to pray that it would be worth it. He's there already. So now pray that I'll speak with boldness, that God will give me utterance so that the things I say will make a difference because I'm already in jail. <laughs> I'm already there. So make this be worth something. We are already in this world. I already told you, until Jesus comes back, he's not going to buy us a private island and let us move out there. No compound in, you know, Royan County. It, it doesn't work that way. We are in you know, we are in the world, not of it. This is his plan. We're already there. So now we should be praying for one another that we would give utterance when the time comes, that we would speak with boldness about the gospel and that others would hear. Because, they're, because those others that hear, they're not our enemies. They're not our enemies. The enemy is the enemy. Satan is the enemy. He may use those other people, but they're not our enemies. Satan is the enemy. And so we filled with the Spirit of God, stand firm and pray these significant strategic prayers so that God would do a, do a, a work in our lives. That's the prayer. Uh, I, I reposted something on Facebook. I saw it. It reminded me of uh, our ladies who pray for me every week. There's a, there's a group of, of ladies who are on, I think they're on group me now. They used to be a, a long text where they would, they would all text together, but uh, they um, they ask me what my prayer requests are for this week. I give it to them and they pass it around and they pray for us. Listen, I'm telling you the secret to my success is no secret. It's God answering the prayers of people who pray for me. There's no, that's it. But it's not limited to me and the, or any pastor. We should be praying for one another that way. We should, we should be lifting one another up in that way. Not just, and I don't mean to 
I don't mean to knock this, but we, aren't, we ought not just to pray for those who are sick or just to pray for those who are in the hospital or just to pray for those. In fact, you would be hard-pressed through the Bible to find people praying for those things. What you find people praying for are unity. You find people praying for power. You find people praying for opportunity, all for the gospel, all for the strategic movement of the kingdom of God throughout, throughout the world. And so that's this call to kingdom living, call to spirit-filled living, uh, starting verse 21, but that you may know about my circumstances, how I am doing, Tychicus, I love saying that, I'm going to say it again, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. So he sends Tychicus, who's the carrier. Let's see if I got one. It's the carrier of the letter. So Tychicus walks up to this church, knocks on their door. I don't know if they have a door or not. Knocks on their door. Hey, come in. Who are you? He says, I'm Tychicus, and I got something for you. They're like, okay, what is it? It's a letter from Paul. And he begins, grace to you and peace from Paul the apostle, called in Jesus Christ. You know, he, he starts reading it. He reads this whole thing. <laughs> Can you imagine him reading this last part? But that you may know about my circumstances, how I'm doing, Tychicus, that's me, <laughs> The beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will make everything known to you. They're like, well, what happened to Paul? Okay, here's, here's how it went. And he starts telling them the story of where Paul is, that he's in prison and all this stuff. I mean, and he fleshes it out. He may give commentary on the letter. He may not. It may stand for itself. But that's, that's the way this ends with Tychicus explaining to them how they're to live. I believe it was, a, it was a circular letter. So I don't think he just stopped at one place. I think he went on to another place, knocked on their door. I said, hello, who are you? He says, I'm Tychicus. I got, a, I got a message from Paul. He walks in and reads it to the group. And that's the way God's word was passed along from people to people. I believe that, I believe that those folks memorized these things. I believe they, because their mind, sorry, their mind was in such a way, they didn't, a lot of them couldn't write, but they could memorize. They could memorize. I know uh, um, Myra tells me of, her, uh, of Sue's dad, who had like an eighth grade education, but was, a, but was a cabinet maker, and he would walk in and measure everything and remember it, right? He, I mean, he just memorized it. He didn't write it down. He went back, cut it, you know, and, and went back and fit it. It, it worked. Um, we had a lady in, in Germantown. She was, um, she was Vietnamese, and she was one of Rebecca's friend's stepmoms, and uh, she was a seamstress. She walked into our house that we had just bought, and in, in our um, living room, so it was a two-story house, but in the living room, there was no second story. It had 20-foot ceilings right in there, all the way to the top, and a little balcony over from our bonus room where you could look down in up there. And uh, so we had these huge walls and huge windows. She walks in. She looks at it. I don't know if she measured anything. I can't remember if she measured it. She may have had a measuring tape or something, and that, but she just looks at it. She goes, okay, you need 18 yards of material. So Myra's like, okay. And so she went and bought 18 yards of the material she wanted. And when we got done, there was a square like this left over. I mean, she, I mean, she just knew. So I, in these days, they had minds like that. They weren't used to, you know, recording stuff on their phone. I, that's the way I remember stuff. I'll, I'll write it down. I have other little games that I try to remember on people's names and, and that kind of stuff. But I can't just hear something and memorize it. I've got to, I've got to think about it. But they, they memorized it. Praise the Lord, we don't have to. We've got it written right in front of us. But here is an encouragement. As we finish this book of Ephesians, I want to encourage you to do something. If you have ever wanted to try to memorize Scripture but have not been able to, I recommend you find something in the book of Ephesians and do it. I recommend that for two reasons. One, it is such a valuable book that anything you, anything you memorize, whether it's one of the prayers that Paul prays, uh, 317 to 21, or whether it's um, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, which is all the blessings we have in Christ, 
uh, whether it's one of those things, uh, they are significant in your life. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, that would be easy. In fact, e- Ephesians 2, 10 was our, our vacation Bible school last year, and all the kids le- learned it. And so you can, you can memorize that. Um, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for his, or for good works, I think, which is, which is according to his good, ple- good pleasure in there somewhere. Good works. Okay, good works. So, it, two, yeah, 210. So you can memorize those things. The other thing that makes Ephesians good, not just that it's weighty, but it, it's written in such a way that it's almost poetic. And so you can memorize. Poems are easier to memorize than prose. Uh, so, and, and, and by the way, if you're going to memorize Scripture, I would recommend memorizing it in either the English Standard Version or in the King James or the New King James. The reason why is those are the closest to poetry that we have, and it's easier to memorize poetry than it is to prose. My, uh, my Word for Word New American Standard is a great study Bible. It is a great way to know exactly what the Word of God says, but it is super hard to memorize from. King James, New King James, English Standard Version are all much easier. New Inter- International Version is tough because it's not poetic as, as those other ones are. So that's just an aside that doesn't have anything to do with book Ephesians. But I would recommend you study and memorize at least a verse from Ephesians. Try it. It's good. It's good for the soul. It's good for being spirit-filled. And uh, it's just good for your practice. What questions do you have about the book of Ephesians? I know it took four weeks to get through it, but what questions do you have? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Uh-huh the Lord. So that's a great question. Um, What she asked was, uh, those who don't have a husband or wife, those who uh, are widowed or divorced or separated or abandoned, and all of those are are possibilities because we we live in a fallen world. But because of that, who do you submit to? The answer is easy. It's to the Lord. I don't mean to say this in a Catholic way, Roman Catholic way, but the Lord is your husband. The Lord Lord will protect you, give his life for you. He already has, but he's the one, and you can submit to him. And then God's people, who are the Lord's hands and feet, help to make sure that you're taken care of in in that relationship. That's why there's so many admonitions for the church to care for widows. It's because the Lord is their is their husband, and we are uh, we serve him, so we serve them. Same with orphans; orphans belong to the Lord. He is there. He's the father to the fatherless, the husband to the husbandless. This is where I get that from. So, yeah, absolutely, yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. So, in it's it's not set. It's not spelled out there, but in. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, it does speak to that very situation on how, how a, a believing wife ought to relate to an unbelieving husband. Because you've asked, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So it's a testimony to them as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. What I, where I, as a counselor, draw the line is if there's abuse or neglect or abandonment included, because I believe other parts of Scripture speak to that. I do not believe that a woman ought to submit herself to violence. I'm not saying that. I mean submit herself to the love, loving care of a loving husband. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's spelled out in 1 Peter 3. In fact, for those of you coming to Man Church tonight, I'm going to be in 1 Peter 3 after that, where it speaks to the husbands and the, and the brothers and the sons. We'll be doing that tonight. I'm just going to skip the whole wife thing since we won't have any wives there tonight. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah. Right. And when he got saved, he was given the Bible. And he picked up that Bible and still says to me when I was there, I have access to that Bible. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let me tell, let me tell you something about that. That's, that's a great testimony. Um, when we were created, Adam and Eve, I believe Adam and Eve were off-the-chart geniuses, right? I believe that's the way God created us, to be filled with knowledge. And sin perverted that. It twisted that. It broke it. Uh, and and I, I don't, I, I do believe, so all truth is God's truth, so I believe that God allows us to advance, even, even lost people to get smarter, but I, I believe that we are still so far away from what we were created to be. And if you remember in Romans, Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. I believe that God's word renews our mind, and, and that doesn't just mean make us not sinful. I believe there's power in, in the Word of God. I believe that people, like she testified about her, uh, about her uncle, I absolutely believe it. I've seen it with, with people who, would, who had been on drugs for so long that their brains were dead. And, and not, not really dead, but I mean, like they just couldn't, they were just, they, they, they were not smart because of the drug use. But when they got to the reading of the Word and when they sat under the constant preaching of the word, God began to do a work in their minds and renewed them. I absolutely believe. So yeah, that's a great testimony. I absolutely believe that we can be renewed in that. All right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I see that hand. Okay, I will do that. Yeah, yeah. I will. I'm gonna, well, I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to do it right now. But I'll do that when we move. I've already been thinking about what to do after New Testament. I'll do a brief thing of that. But let me just say it right now. There are three marks of canonization, of making something the Word of or of us recognizing the Word of God. So, first of all, when God spoke through those men, when they wrote it down, it was the Word of God then. It never became the Word of God. What canonization does is recognize it as the Word of God. So, so it's our recognition. So there are three marks of it. The first is uh, apostolicity. <laughs> I can't say it right now. Apostolicity. I have to read it to say it. That means it's connected to an apostle. Mark's gospel very probably is Peter's story written by Mark or recorded by Mark. Luke was connected to whom? Paul. That's right. Paul. He wrote to Theophilus. That's right. He did write, to, but he was connected to Paul the apostle. Uh, there, there, there's a connection uh, to, uh, to, to, with the apostles. An apostle in this case is someone who saw the works of Jesus before he died and saw him after he rose again from the dead. Uh, Paul did it, but out of time. Remember, he's one called, so we can, we can talk about that. So that's the first one. It's connected to an apostle. The second one is that it is in line with all the rest of the biblical teaching. So it's not weird. I don't know how else to say it except that. It doesn't, it's not weird. So in their case, it would have to build on the Old Testament. If y'all realize when I preached the Old Testament, or when I taught you the Old Testament before, what we did was it, I showed it as it built up to Jesus. You may wonder why that is, because I believe that everything in the New Testament connects, corresponds with the Old Testament. If you read the Gospels, if you read what these guys are preaching, after the Holy Spirit came upon Peter at Pentecost, if you read what he's preaching, he's preaching Old Testament sermons. 
But he's showing that Jesus was the fulfillment of those Old Testament sermons. So, um, so it, has to, it has to coincide with all that came before it. So that's the second one. It connected to an apostle. It, had to, it has to go in league with everything else. And then the third is that the, it's called Catholicity, small c. It means that it, it was used and found useful by the preponderance of the churches. And so it was already set. They were already in the first century reading these things that were coming. They were reading this book of Ephesians as it went around. They were reading Paul's letters, Romans. And how did they know they were true? They were comparing them to the Old Testament scriptures as fulfilled in Christ. And so they're, bless you. So they're building all of this stuff in, uh, they're, they're building all of this up so that by the time the, the church got together to vote on things, there was already the canon was already formed by use, by uh, the, the churches were, they were just confirming what they had already, already been doing. So there's, there's not a vote really that says this is, this isn't. There was just a, there was a vote, but it was just to say, hey, this stuff that we're using are the official ones. Nothing else that comes later is going to usurp these, these that we've got. Does that help? All right. You can either limit my time or limit my topic, but you can't do both. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can't even do both, right? <laughs> so, I mean, no, I hear you. We'll, we'll do that. Um, in the meantime, I may, I may email you some stuff just so you can read about it. It is. It is. But it's not the same. Okay, I just, <laughs> I just, yeah, that's right. Translation process is good, but it's not the same. The King James was not in, re-inspired in 1611, and, and there are people who believe that. That's why I'm making, I'm not just making a joke. There are people who believe that God re-inspired the word with the King James Bible, and that did not happen. Uh, it was done when the original writers wrote the original autographs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it was from Paul. Yeah, that's, but that's how they knew it. When, when, when Tychicus walks in and says, hey, Paul sent me, this is his latest letter, they listened to it. They compared it, and then they, they are like, oh, man, that's really, really good. And so over time, let's say that Jim Collier sent them a letter too, and Rebecca carried that one. So Rebecca shows up right after Tychicus and says, hey, Dad sent this one. Y'all listen to this. And I said, hey, the Bucks won last Monday night. It was awesome. And uh, they're looking forward to a game this week. Pray for him that that all goes well. Well, they're going to be like, okay, that's cool. I'm glad, Rebecca, that we heard from your dad. But they wouldn't keep reading it. It was, it was clearly, there was clearly a distinction. And over time, they separated the ones that were, the, the, the ones that were God's word based on all those three things I told you about, they, they, it became their habit to use this one and to exclude the one from Jim Collier because it was dumb, right? Or it didn't fit. It wasn't worth it. I know you're still at, but you, <clears throat> I've really exhausted all we can know about the way it worked. I mean, like, what you want to know is Jim Bob, the, the chief elder at Ephesus, said, that's a great one. We're going to keep that one. Uh, and we don't have record of that. We don't, we don't know how, how it was received. All we know is what was written, and that was preserved. And we know that it was useful because of the marks of canonization. But we don't know. We don't, there's no deliberation process that we have record of, like the minutes of our last church conference where they voted it in. We don't have that. So, so the Apocrypha came during the silent years between Malachi and Matthew, and they were, they were translated um, when they were translated into Greek when the, uh, the Septuagint was translated. So when, as the culture changed in Palestine, as the culture changed in Palestine, and people stopped being able to read Hebrew as easily as they could read Greek, 
that there were people that wanted to preserve the Bible primarily, but also their other writings. The Apocrypha are those other writings. It was never a problem in, in Hebrew life. Where it became a problem was when Jerome in the second or third century, fourth century, second century, when, I don't know, uh, when was Jerome around? Second, third, fourth century, when Jerome translated them into Latin, he did the whole thing, the Apocrypha too. And so the, the church, the Roman church who spoke Latin incorporated the Apocrypha too, even though it was never intended to be a part. Fourth century? Yeah, fourth century. So after, even after, um, even after the rest was canonized then, he translated it. Yeah, even after the canonization of what we have, he translated it. And so it, it was added into the, that's why Catholic Bibles today have it, is because they're, they're going off of Jerome's translations from the, from the Septuagint way back in the fourth century. Yeah, which is, why, which is why when Martin Luther thumbed his nose at Rome and, and, and translated it into German, he went back to the original documents, the Septuagint, the Greek New Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, and came back with what we have today. Did I say that right? Is that right? Is that right? Good. I want you all to know, I know a lot of stuff, but I don't remember a lot of stuff. And... Uh, and I, Ever, I tell you this all the time. When I come in here, I load up to come in here. And if you ask me something that's outside that, I may or may not be able to bring it up. So that's why I'm asking them. It, it, I, no, 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 that's all right. I, I love talking about this. I just don't, I'm just not sure of myself without doing some more research. Uh, as they say in North Alabama, I nearly know that that's the truth. <laughs> I nearly know that that's the truth. So, all right. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for paying attention. God bless you. Have a great day. Next Thursday, by the way, is Young Hearts, not, not this. We will meet again in February, and we will start then. All right? So we'll, we'll pick up uh, with whatever's next, Philippians, and, uh, and go through the book of Philippians then. God bless you. Have a great day.